Hello, Curran here. This video is about the general update pattern of D3. If you already know the basics of D3 data joins and scales, meaning you've used maybe enter.append, but you have no prior experience rendering dynamic data or dynamic graphics, then this video is for you. The topics we're going to cover here include enter, exit, and update. This is sort of the core general update pattern. We're also going to talk about merge, merging usually the enter and the update selections together. We're also going to talk about animated transitions and object constancy. We'll also deal with some special cases of the general update pattern like nested elements and singular elements. Let's start with a bowl of fruit. We're going to write a program that sort of mimics a bowl of fruit, meaning you can put things into the bowl, you can take things out of the bowl, and you can even swap things in the bowl. Let's talk about enter. My bowl of fruit was empty, so I just went out and bought five apples. So let's make a program that renders five apples in our bowl of fruit. I'm going to start by forking this face example and renaming it to bowl of fruit general update pattern and I'll just clean it up a little bit get rid of the stuff in the old re readme in index.js I'm going to delete everything except for the basic SVG starting point and we don't need arc from d3 in this code here where are we going to get the fruits from I think I'll make a function called make fruit that's going to construct a fruit object for us so here I'll say const make fruit is a function. And each fruit can have, a, let's say, a type. So it'll take as input type and return. Let's have it return a new object. And this object can just contain the type. And then let's make some fruits. Let's say const fruits. This is going to be an array of fruits. To add one apple, we could say make fruit and then pass in as the type apple. But to add five apples, we can make use of D3's range function. This function, you give it a number and it just gives an array of integers with that many uh, elements. So we can say fruits equals range of five and then we can say dot map and pass it a function that returns an apple. And now let's say console.log fruits just to make sure that what we have here is working. All right, we've got this array of five objects and each of which has a type, which is apple. All right, so far so good. What we're going to do next here is use the D3 data join and use the enter selection to add circles for each of these five apples. So I'll get rid of this console.log. So we can make a data join by saying svg dot select all circle dot data fruits. Then on this data join, we can call dot enter and then on the enter selection, that's where we want to append new circles. And from here, we can set up the attributes. Circles need a CX and CY. I'm thinking these circles will start over here at the left and then go to the right sort of in a stack. So for the X position, we can have it be a function of the fruit D and the index in the array. And let's just spread out these circles so we can return, say, i times, I don't know, 100 to separate them by 100 pixels. And then for the y attribute, I mean for the cy attribute, this is just going to be in the middle vertically. So we can say this is going to be height divided by 2. And last but not least, in order to see these circles, we need to set the radius attribute. So ATTR R for radius, and let's set it to be, I don't know, 50 pixels. All right, we've got these apples here. So far, so good. Let's move these to the right a little bit. 
by adding some constant here. Let's say I'll add 60. And we can spread these out a little bit by multiplying by, let's say, 120. And since these are apples, let's make them red by setting the fill attribute. ETTR fill is just red. I think I'll just pick a nice deeper red color here that apples really are, because the default red is really pretty bright. All right, so we can use this color for our apples. Yeah. All right, so we've used the enter part of the general update pattern. Let's discuss a little bit more about what these lines here are doing. When you call select all and then dot data, that's when you create a D3 data join. The data join of D3 concerns itself with data, an array of data, and elements, as in DOM elements, for example, our circle elements. And it's able to handle these three cases of enter, update, and exit. Enter is the case where there are data elements, but there are no corresponding DOM elements. And this is why, actually, we need to call select all first, so that the D3 data join knows what elements are present already, sort of beforehand. So in our code, we call svg.selectAllCircle, and there are no circles at the time that it's called. But this is actually important information for the internals of the D3 data join, because then it knows to trigger the enter selection for all of our data points. When we call dot enter, this sort of takes effect for all of our data points initially, because there are no corresponding DOM elements initially for our data elements. The D3 data join intends to make the DOM elements match up with whatever data elements you pass in to this. So these three cases need to be handled in order for this to happen. This is different from other libraries like React or Vue that sort of handle all of this under the hood, you know, automatically. But with D3, you need to explicitly handle enter, update, and exit yourself in the code. This is, you know, a bit burdensome, but it gives great flexibility with regard to transitions, as we'll see later. But anyway, that's what the enter selection is all about. Before we move on, I think I'll just run through this code one more time. When we say svg.selectAllCircle, that makes an empty selection, because there are no circles at the time that this code is invoked. This is essentially setting up the elements part of the D3 data join. So we've got the elements, and there are no elements at first, and then to create the data join, we need to give it the data part, an array of objects, or an array of anything, really, but it has to be an array. The call to dot data sets up the data part of the data join. With the elements and the data in hand, the D3 data join is fully capable of figuring out how many elements are in each of these three different um, selections. The enter part is where there are data elements but no corresponding DOM elements. The update part is when there are data elements and DOM elements that correspond to those data elements. An exit is for when there are elements, DOM elements, on the page that don't have any corresponding data elements. The thing that gets returned from dot data is the data join itself. And on that data join, we can call dot enter to compute the enter selection. When we say dot append, this will cause, uh, in our case, circle elements to be appended for each and every one of our data elements that don't have a corresponding DOM element. And in this case, it's all of them. So it appends five circles. That's a sort of summary of what's happening in these lines here. Next, let's talk about the exit case. I just ate an apple. Because as they say, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. What happens here is one of these apples should disappear. And then we should only see four apples, the remaining apples, after I ate that one. 
The first thing we need to do in the code is remove one of these apples from our fruits array. We can do that using an array method called pop. So we can say fruits.pop. This will remove the one, the last element of the array. And I think I'll just add a comment here like eat an apple. We can create the same data join again, although it's not exactly the same because data is different and has one fewer element. And on this data join, we can call dot exit to compute the exit selection. And this returns a selection just like, you know, any other selection. So we can call things like dot attr. So what I'm going to do is just mark it as black. See that? One of our apples turned black. But usually, you don't want to set the attributes of things in the exit selection. Instead, you want to remove them from the DOM completely. And to do that, you can say dot exit dot remove. This will just remove everything in the exit selection from the DOM. And this here is what we want. This is exactly right. I've eaten one of the apples, and now there are four. While it does work to have two chunks of code, one up here and one down here, usually both of these sets of logic is combined into one function that takes as input um, sort of the state that you want to represent in the DOM and it has the side effect of mutating the DOM so that it matches with whatever you pass in. So let's do that. Let's merge these two chunks of logic into a function and then invoke that function twice. Once for the original five apples and then again for the four apples after you eat one. So here I'll say const render equals and I found the following structure to work sort of overall generically to make um, D3 components that are sort of similar to React components. And the signature is as follows. The first argument is a selection. This is going to be the selection of the parent element, in our case SVG. And then the second argument is props, paying homage to React props or properties that get passed in. This is going to be an object and we can add things later on but initially it's just going to have one thing, our fruits. So this is going to be a function and I'm just going to wrap this logic in our curly braces and indent it and then move this logic into that function. And then I'll take this render function and just move it up to the top. This is so that it's clear that like, okay, this is our rendering logic and down here is going to be our state manipulation logic where we have the fruits. So after we make our original fruits, this is where we can invoke this function for the first time. We can say render and the first argument can be SVG and the second argument can be an object with one property, I'll just call it fruits. And in this inner logic now, um, I want to make this independent of the code around it so that it could be potentially split out into a separate module. It's still working right now because everything happens to be in scope. But let me just change it so that everything in here just depends on the arguments to the function. So instead of saying svg.selectall, we can say selection dot select all and fruits we can unpack from the props so we could say props dot fruits but I prefer to use um, destructuring instead so instead of props we can say all right destructure whatever comes in there as fruits like that now fruits is in scope here so we can just use it and then also for the second piece of logic, I'll say selection here. So we invoke this function once. Let's invoke it again after we eat the apple. So I'm going to copy paste that down here. And now it shows four apples. The general update pattern is good for showing 
change over time. It's really for things that change over time. So before we go any further, I'd like to introduce a time element to this, where this, eating an apple, should happen after some time. Let's say after one second. So we, what we can do to accomplish this is we can say set timeout. This is a browser built-in, by the way. The first argument is a function. And the second argument to set timeout is the number of milliseconds to wait before invoking that function. So for one second, we can say a thousand milliseconds. Now inside of the body of this function, we can eat the apple. So I'm going to cut that, paste it inside the body of the function, indent it, clean it up a little bit. And I think I'll just move this comment to the outside here. But now you can see when it runs, there are five, and then after one second, see when I edit the text, it runs five apples and then four apples after one second. So that's how we can wait a second before removing one of the fruits. But in the render function here, already I see some duplicated logic. We make the data join once here, and then we make the same data join again down there. What we could do instead is make this into a variable. We can say const, let's say, circles equals selection.selectAllCircle.data fruits. That's one statement. And then we can say circles.enter.append, and then also down here, circles.exit.remove. See, circles is the data join itself, so it knows how to create the enter selection as well as the exit selection. So that's how we can eliminate that duplicated logic. To tie it back to this diagram, the exit selection is the case where there are sort of leftover, old, stale, unwanted DOM elements that don't correspond to any data elements anymore. So in the case of our circles, our apples, when we eat one of the apples and we, we pop that element off the array, and then we make the second data join, the second time we invoke the render function, the enter selection is empty, the update selection has those four apples in it, and the exit selection has that one leftover circle, and that's how the D3 data join populates the exit selection so that we can remove that um, unwanted circle. The overall effect of using enter and exit is that the number of DOM elements that we end up with after we invoke that render function matches with the length of our data array. Next, let's talk about update. I just replaced an apple with a lemon. See, I just went out to the market and uh, picked up this lemon. And when I got home, I was really hungry, so I took this apple out of the bowl of fruit. But I put this lemon back in its place. So essentially, I transformed the apple into the lemon. I updated the apple to be a lemon instead. Let's do that in code. It's going to be very similar to eating an apple. So I'm going to copy paste that logic. But instead of waiting one second, we should do this after two seconds. And instead of eating an apple, this is going to be replacing an apple with a lemon. And just as a side note, notice what's happening now. It starts with five, goes down to four, and then it pops another one off and goes down to three. So this is working correctly after this fruits.pop call, but that's not what we want to do. We just want to change the type of one of our fruits. Let's say that instead of calling fruits.pop, what we want to do is update this third one in from the left to be a lemon. In terms of array indices, this is fruits at index 0, at index 1, and at index 2. So to access this one here, we can say in our code, fruits at index 2. And we can set the type of this by saying dot type equals lemon. 
If you compare this apple to this lemon, you'll notice that the lemon is yellow, not red, and it's also smaller. So let's uh, account for these facts in our code. What we want here is sort of a one-to-one -one mapping between fruit types, apple and lemon, to different colors that we're going to use for fill and different radii that we're going to use. We can use D3 ordinal scales for this. So I'm going to start here by removing this color and I'm going to say, all right, color scale of D dot type. And to access D, we need to make this a function here. D will be each of our different fruits. Now let's set up this color scale. We need to import scale ordinal from D3. And down here we can say const color scale equals scale ordinal, a new ordinal scale. And the domain of this is going to be our types of fruits. So I'm going to make an array with the first element being apple and the second element being lemon. The range here is going to be our colors. So we can say range is an array where the apple color is the first element. That's the color we had before. And the second element is, let's just say yellow for our lemon. We can apply the same logic to create an ordinal scale to have the two different sizes for these. So instead of color scale, this is going to be radius scale. And down here, when we set the radius, we can say, all right, it takes as input D and it returns the radius scale of D dot type. And 50 is what we want it to be for apples. So in the range for apples, that's going to be 50. And the range for the lemon will be, let's say 30, because it's smaller. Now, notice how it's not updating to show us that lemon. Even though we've changed the type of that third element there to be lemon, and then we called the render function again. I mean, what we would expect to happen here is that this right here would show up as a lemon. But it's not. Why is that? That's because all of our logic for setting the uh, attributes here is based on the enter selection. And this is actually a case that you'll come across a lot when you try to pick up uh, random D3 examples that you find. Static examples with D3 usually just use the enter selection because there's no need to use the update or the exit selection if it's just static. And that's the simplest way to do it, just to use enter. But if you want to make that code into a component that's reusable or changes over time, you need to refactor it to use this general update pattern and handle all these different cases. Coming back to this diagram, I wanted to say that the update selection, it's the case where there are existing DOM elements that do correspond to the data elements that you have. For example, there's already that circle there, that circle DOM element is there that corresponds to the data element that we changed to a lemon. And if we set that attribute in the update selection, then things will change. But since we're just setting it in the enter selection, that's why it's not updating. So how do we get at this update selection? I mean, circles.enter is the enter selection, circles.exit is the exit selection. You'd think that maybe circles.update would be the update selection, but it turns out that circles itself is the update selection. In D3, the data join itself is the update selection. So we can handle the update case by saying, all right, circles.attr, all this stuff that's driven by the data. I mean, I'll just copy paste those lines here and let's see if it works. All right, it turned into a lemon. See that? That color is terrible, though. You can hardly see it. I think I'll just pick a new color. Let's get a nice 
lemony color that's a little bit darker so you can actually see it, you know. That looks pretty good. So I'll just replace yellow with that new color. All right, it's working. So let me just run the program again so you can see it. There's first five apples, there's four apples, and then that apple changes to a lemon. This diagram from the 2011 paper on D3 by Mike Bostock, Vadim Ogievitsky, and Jeff Hare might shed some light on why the update selection is the data join. And enter and exit are selections you get when you invoke methods. I think when you invoke dot data, these elements that are shown in black here are computed as the, the join, the data join, joining the data elements with the nodes, the DOM elements. And in the original paper, enter and exit are described as sub-selections, and maybe that's why they're represented here as white circles rather than black circles. But anyway, this is a nice visual alternative to the Venn diagram that has a bit more complexity and shows some of the nuance of the data join. Next, let's talk about merge. In our code here, we have some duplicated logic. We're setting fill and R here, and we're also setting fill and R here. One of these, this top one, is on the enter selection, and the other is on the update selection. Wouldn't it be nice if there were a way that we could somehow combine the enter selection and the update selection so that we can get rid of this duplicated logic and just have this logic apply to one selection that contains both the enter selection and the update selection. This is where merge comes into the picture. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to first just get rid of this logic there and then add a new line here before we set the fill and R attributes and we can say dot merge and pass in circles. Notice how everything is still working correctly. It's switching to a lemon there. What's going on here is we're calling dot merge on the enter selection, which is returned from this last expression here. So you can think of all of this as defining the enter selection. And then we're passing in circles, the update selection. So when you call merge on the enter selection and pass in the update selection, this merge function returns a brand new selection that contains both the enter selection and the update selection. When we do this, these lines of code here sort of take effect for both circles that are entering for the case of the initial case where there are five apples and also shapes that are, you know, just being updated where the DOM elements were there and there are corresponding data elements. That case is, for example, the apple turning into the lemon there. Any attributes that you want to change on subsequent invocations need to be set within the merged enter and update selection. And if you set things in the enter selection, they will only take effect for, well, the enter selection, the case where the DOM element is being added. At that time, that data, that snapshot of the data, when the element is being added for the first time, is going to be used to compute the attributes. For example, just to, sh just to show the point here, if we move fill to be assigned in the enter selection, look at what happens. It doesn't change the fill color for the lemon. It uses the fill color for the original thing there, which was an apple. So that's why you should set any attributes that you want to possibly change between invocations on the merged enter and update selection. So that's how you can use merge to avoid duplicated logic. That completes the general update pattern. So this here is an example of the complete general update pattern that handles enter, update, and exit. 
Note that CX and CY are being set in the Enter selection, and that's fine for this particular case, because height is not changing between invocations, and nor is the index. See, we're not actually removing anything in the middle. But if we were to do that, then we should move this to the merged Enter and Update selections. In this diagram, this is where the merged Enter and Update selection would be. And this is what the merged Enter and Update selection would look like in this diagram. This file here is getting a bit unwieldy, so before we move on to animated transitions, I would like to extract this rendering logic into a separate module. This module, I think, should be called Bowl of Fruit. Or actually, how about Fruit Bowl? So I renamed that function to Fruit Bowl. And here, I'm going to export this as a module. Export const Fruit Bowl. And I'm going to copy this logic and actually cut it out of this file and make a new file called fruitbowl.js. And over in fruitbowl.js, I'm going to paste that logic into here. Then we can import fruit bowl from dot slash fruit bowl, our file here. And we're going to need to rearrange a few things to make this work. For example, the scales should be defined in that fruit bowl.js because that's where they're used. So I'll define them here. That makes them local to the module. And we need to import scale ordinal in this file. So I'm going to copy this line of imports, remove scale ordinal from here, and then in fruitbowl.js, I'm going to paste that and just import scale ordinal because I think that's all we need here from D3. Now back in index.js, we can sort of redefine render. So we can say const render equals and this is going to be a function that, when it executes, will invoke fruit bowl, passing in SVG and whatever is required for the fruit bowl. So let me take a look and see what is that. It's just fruits for now. So back in index.js, I'm going to pass in fruits as our props. And then when we invoke render, all we need to do is call it, because it's taking SVG and fruits and passing it internally into that fruit bowl component. So down here is just going to be render, and down here as well, it'll just be render. Now, I have a feeling something is missing. See, in fruit bowl, we're using height, but that's actually not in our scope. So we can add that to the props and unpack it there. But now this line is getting a little too long, so I'm going to replace that with props here, and then unpack the props inside. We can say const and paste that destructuring expression there and say equals props. All right, now it's running, but I, I don't think we're passing in height, so we need to modify our index.js to pass in height right here. There we go. Now they're back in the middle. And to simplify this code a little bit, I think we can just remove width because we're not actually using it anywhere. And the only place we're using height is passing it into our fruit bowl. So I can just specify it in line like that. No need for an extra variable. And it's a bit awkward how fruits is defined after the render function, but it's being referenced there. So I'm just going to move that definition down a little bit. Just, just, I think, makes it more readable. All right, that's how you can split out a module that sort of implements a component. And this is similar in behavior and structure to React components, because you pass in your props, and then the component is responsible for rendering itself based on those props and making the DOM match up with whatever you specify in these props. I just ate another apple.
because, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. What I'd like to do here is remove this apple, the second apple in, just to make sure that we've handled all the cases properly. And the logic is very similar to eating the first apple. And so after three seconds, see I'll change this 1,000 to 3,000 to do this after three seconds. And instead of fruits.pop, which takes the rightmost apple, I want to take the second apple in. And to do this, we can say fruits equals fruits.filter and we pass a function that takes as input D and I, the index. And what we want to do is just remove that second one in. So that's going to be at index 1. So we can return I is not equal to 1 to include everything that's not at index 1. This should be working. We should see one fewer element there. Maybe there's an error. Oh, there it is, assignment to a constant variable. Looks like fruits is a constant, so we're reassigning it here. Uh, so we should actually use let if we want to do reassigning. Now let's see what happens after three seconds. Boom, all right, actually it worked. See that? All right, now we've got enough interesting cases for animated transitions. In our fruit bowl.js, Let's add an animated transition where the apples sort of pop into existence. They grow from small circles to large circles. We can do that by setting R to be 0 in the Enter selection. And then we can introduce a transition here by saying dot transition. See that? They all sort of grew into existence. And see how the radii change? We can slow these down by setting a duration. So I'm going to say duration is, let's say, one second. Yeah, see now they grow more slowly. And let's also set a transition on the exit selection so that they shrink out of existence instead of just disappearing. See right now they're just disappearing. We can do this by setting a transition also with a duration of one second on the exit selection and in that transition we can set the radius to be zero. Watch this. Okay, now they're popping out of existence. See that? Now the dot remove, it only removes the DOM element after this transition is over. But let's study this animation carefully. If I run this, notice how they pop into existence, disappears, that changes, but see that last transition? See how, like, let me do it again. After three seconds, the lemon that's here, it doesn't really move over to there like it should, you know? It changes back to an apple, and then the one next to it changes into a lemon. But what should happen is after three seconds, this lemon should actually move to the left. This brings us to our next topic of object constancy. Object constancy means that the DOM elements hold a, a constant correlation to their corresponding data elements. This means that the D3 data join needs to somehow know how these should map up. And usually this is um, a key function, or it's an ID. It, it lets D3 know what the unique ID is for each data element. And by default, it uses the index. If you don't specify anything, it uses the index. And that's the behavior that we're seeing here. Just the index is used, and but that's not a proper representation of a unique ID in this last case here, where we remove a fruit in the middle. So let's solve this problem. In our fruit bowl, we can actually pass a second argument to dot data, which is the key function that returns a unique ID for each element. So I'm going to pass in a function that takes as input D, one of our fruits, and it returns D.ID. And D.ID we have not defined. So in our index.js, when we make a fruit, why don't we 
give it a unique ID. So instead of just having a type, it could have an ID, and this could be, let's just say, a random number, math.random. This will just give us a random number between 0 and 1. And see what happened here, though. It's sort of correct in that the second apple did get removed, but these didn't move over. That's because in our fruitbowl.js, we're computing CX just in the enter selection. Whereas we should really move this now into the merged enter and update selection. And actually, if we want things to move around, we should set this in the transition. So I'm going to try removing it from here and then setting it in this transition. All right, see that? These two fruits moved over to the left, which is sort of what they should do. But notice also that when the program runs, everything starts at a CX of zero and then transitions, which I guess is fine. But if we want everything to be initialized to the initial positions, we'll have to um, put this over here. See, so instead of doing that, you can do this, where they all start at the correct locations. And with this sort of duplication, there's not anything like merge where you can uh, get rid of this duplicated logic. So the best thing that you can do here is split it out into a function. So I'm going to make this into a function. I think I'll just call it x position. And I think we can define that outside of our fruit bowl because it really just depends on its inputs. So we can say const exposition is this function right here. And then we can use this exposition function down here as well. So now we don't have that duplicated logic anymore. Next, let's talk about dealing with nested elements with the general update pattern. For this, I'm going to start by forking our original general update pattern example without the animated transitions, because the transitions make the nested version of the general update pattern really complex. So I'm going to fork this one here. If you were to just show this page to somebody, chances are they wouldn't just guess that this is an apple and this is a lemon. So why don't we add text labels underneath these different fruits? We are inside fruitbowl.js, and we've already got these circles here. And we would like to use similar logic to add text labels. So to do that, to do the first pass of text labels without nesting, I'm just going to copy paste that logic there and change circles to text. So now the variables text, we're going to select all text elements. And then we're going to say text.enter.append, and then dot merge circles, and then text.exit.remove. And we're merg merging with text there, not circles. Oh, this circle here should be text. Now, text elements accept x and y. So I'm going to change cx to x and cy to y. And text elements don't accept R, and we don't want to change the fill color, but what we do want to do is set the text of the actual element. And the text should be set to, well, a function that takes as input D and returns D.type. All right, now we've got these text labels. It says apple, lemon, apple. Before we go any further, I would like to address the styling issue of these. We can do that in our styles.css. We can say, all right, for all of our text elements, let's make the font size maybe 3EM. And to center it with respect to the coordinates that we give it, we can set text-anchor to be middle. All right, and I think I'd like these to appear 
down below. So we can go back to our fruitbowl.js and just add some offset to the Y position. So we can say plus, I don't know, 200, How about 150. There we go. Eh, 140, 120 looks good to me. And I would just like to set that font to be, yeah, we can set font-family to be sans serif. Yeah, I kind of like that. All right, so we've added these labels, but if we take a look at fruitbowl.js, it's just the same logic repeated. And we do have some duplicated logic here in that we're setting x here and cx here to be the exact same function. One common technique when you have things that you want to group together, like for example the circle and the text label, is to use SVG group elements and then position the whole group um, by setting the transform on the parent group element and then the position of the child elements will sort of follow or inherit from the parent group element. So let's do that here. Let's have this pattern for SVG group elements and then we'll start to see the nested variant of the general update pattern unfold. So what I'm going to do here is copy this logic for the circles and I'm going to paste it above and change this to groups. And instead of circle elements, these will be G elements, SVG group elements. And instead of circles here, we should say groups dot enter dot append dot merge groups and then groups dot exit dot remove. Since R and fill apply to the circles, I'm going to remove that logic from the groups. And since I remember from the transitions, um, this really should be set on the merged selection. So I'm going to restructure this code a little bit and say groups.enter.append g on one single line, dot merge groups, and then in here is where we can set x and y. But we don't need to set cx and cy on the groups. We need to use the transform attribute. So we can say dot attr transform and this can be a function that takes as input D and I and returns, let's put it on an, a new line here. It's gonna return that translate string. So we can use the template literal string syntax here, the back ticks, and say translate something in the X direction and something else in the Y direction. And that thing that it should be in the X direction is this right here. And the thing that it should be in the y direction is height divided by 2. Now I can delete these cx and cy lines. What we want to do next is change around this logic here for the circles to add the circles into these group elements as opposed to having them at the same level, which they are right now. Instead of creating a new data join, we're going to leverage this data join here and take advantage of the, um, the various selections, enter, update, and exit, on the groups. So we don't need to call dot data here. I'm going to delete that. So at circles here is the update selection for the circles. And to get at the update selection, we can say groups dot select circle. This will select the existing circle elements that are children of these group elements. Notice that we don't need select all, we just need select because the groups selection itself has multiple groups and within each one of those groups we just want to select one circle. When it comes to the enter selection of the nested version of the general update pattern, we actually need access to this here, the enter selection for the groups. So what I'm going to do here is make this into a variable. We can say const groups enter equals groups.enter.append g, and that's where that statement can end. And then for the merge, we can do it like this. Groups enter 
dot merge groups. So we can use this variable groups enter and we can say groups enter dot append circle like that. And I'll just change the indentation so it's a bit more clear. Groups enter dot append circle. This is dealing with still the enter selection. And since circles is just being used here, we can actually move this into this call to dot merge and get rid of this variable circles. And since the parent groups are being removed on the exit selection of the groups, we actually don't need this line of code here, circles.exit.remove. And I'm a bit confused about why this is the way it is, and I think it's because of a typo right here. I misspelled translate. It should be T-R-A-N-S-late. Yeah. See, now we're seeing the <laughs> the like double effect of translating it in the group element and also setting CX and CY on the circles. Since the default CX and CY for circles is zero, we can actually just delete these two lines and use the translated uh, nature of the parent groups. Now we can simplify this a bit further and this is what really the nested version of the general update pattern looks like. One interesting aspect of this merge call here is that it really could go either way. So let me just show you an alternate way of doing it. We could say groups dot select circle dot merge groups enter dot append circle and it works just exactly the same way. So that's just sort of an FYI. I'm going to put it back to the way it was because um, it doesn't really matter which way it is. All right, so that's really it. That's the nested version of the general update pattern. We've done it for the circles. Now let's do it for the text. The simplest way to do this, I think, is just to copy paste that and change it to be for text. So append text merge it with the text, X and Y. Um, we don't need, although we do need to move it down by 120 pixels, but let me just take care of this te dot text first. On the merged, enter an update selection for the text, we can say dot text is that. Okay, that's working, see? But what we should do is also set the Y. So I'm gonna set the Y in here but because we're already transforming by height divided by two in the parent group, we could remove this height divided by two and just set the Y to be 120, to move it 120 pixels down with respect to its parent group element. All right, that's the nested version of the general update pattern for our text, and we can remove this dead code down there. Just to sort of summarize what we've done here, let me show you what the DOM looks like. Within our SVG element, we have three group elements after the whole program runs. And within each one of these group elements, we've got a circle and a text element. And by the way, this is the same structure that D3Axes uses for the ticks. And we can use this same kind of code to make, I don't know, a color legend or a size legend. So that's the DOM structure that we've created here. Here's an exercise for you. What I'd like you to do is take this example, fork it, and add the transitions into this example. That'll be a good exercise to really understand what's going on with the nested version of the general update pattern and animated transitions. So good luck. The last topic I want to touch upon here is singular elements. When you see this here, you know, okay, we've got an apple, a lemon, and another apple, but are they really inside of a bowl? I mean, you have to sort of imagine a bowl there. So instead, let's have a big bowl object or shape in the background 
for these fruits to sort of reside in. So what I'm thinking here is that we have sort of an oblong bowl, maybe a rounded rectangle shape as a bowl behind these fruits. So before we actually add these groups, let's add the bowl. Here I can say const bowl equals, um, let's just append a rect for now. We can say selection dot append rect. And to see this rect, we need to set the width and the height. So I can say dot attr width is, I don't know, I'll just set it to something like 500 for now, just so we can see it. And then also let's set the height of this. All right, we're seeing something here. I think I'll set the height a little bit less, maybe, I don't know, 300. And I want to move it down so that it uh, encompasses these fruits. So for that, we can say dot ettr of y to set the y coordinate and move it down a little bit, maybe 100 pixels down. All right, there we go. Now it sort of encompasses, you know, sort of the area where our fruits are. And I think I'll make it a little bit longer. So the, the width can be, let's say, 800. That doesn't include all the apples in the beginning. So let me just say 900 or how about 910? There we go. Or 920. That looks good initially. We can give this bowl rounded edges by saying dot ATTR RX, which I believe is the roundedness in the X direction of the corners. And we can say RX is Let's say 40, see what that looks like. Since it's a bowl, I'd like it to sort of be circular on the edges. So that means um, the Rx should be maybe the height, 300 divided by 2. There we go. That looks like a nice oblong bowl. Now, we have a problem here because we're just appending a new rectangle every time this fruit bowl function gets invoked. So if we inspect the DOM here and take a look at what's going on, see we've got the rect from our first invocation, and then all of our group elements, and then on top of that we've got more rectangles, one for each invocation. So that's why we can't see our fruits, because this rectangle is on top of them. What we need here is to use the general update pattern, but we just want one of these rectangles. So this is what I like to call the general update pattern special case for singular elements, or for managing a single element. And we can do this by saying selection.selectAll rect. And we can go about creating a data join. We can say, all right, selection.selectAll rect dot data. But what's the data here? We just want one thing. So this data should be an array with a single element. And really, it doesn't matter what this element is. But by convention, I'm going to use null because I saw this pattern in the code for D3 axes. Now that we've got this data join, we can access the enter selection by saying dot enter. And then on the enter selection is where we should append the rectangle. And now, see that? The circles are in front of that rectangle in the back. So that's it right there. That's the general update pattern special case for managing a single element. And by the way, everything is working here in the enter selection because these are all constants and they don't depend on the data. But if you did have something that depended on the data, you could, um, you know, merge the enter and update selection, and then set things there. But I'm not going to do that right now because this is working for our case. The last thing I'll do here is just change the color of this so that we can still read the text. And I think I'll do that over in styles.css. We can say for all of our rect elements, and we just have that one for now, the fill can be well, what color are bowls anyway? I mean, uh, maybe like a a very light brownish, grayish sort of color, just to give a sense that something is there. 
Yeah, I'll try this color here. Yeah, there we go. That's a more well-defined bowl. All right, that's all for the general update pattern of D3. Thanks for watching. Take care.